Hi, this is Dr. Zavala. I want to talk to you about what is the reason, the, the real reason behind our increasing obesity epidemic. I discuss with my patients almost on a daily basis about this topic. And the reason I developed this talk is to try to address the usual guilt, frustration that my patients tell me when they try to accomplish weight loss and try to address the reason behind this that I really don't believe is just the lack of discipline, the genetics that you personally have, why we are developing such a problem in our society. For us to understand this, uh, I have to address a little bit of history. Now, at the end of this video, you will be able to understand the reality and explanation of why we are fat and how, in very large part, everything comes from economic interest and fraudulent science. Now, I want to specify that my talk is controversial, goes uh, uh, against uh, the information you are getting from many of your doctors and other sources of information you might obtain. So this is not medical advice in any way, but I want to uh, give you my personal opinion of why we are facing this situation. And this is based on over 45 years on ex of experience, initially dealing with medical and surgical patients for many years, then into the cardiology specialty I have, mostly opening arteries in all of my patients as a consequence of the lifestyle they have. And in the last 15 years, from the cosmetic surgery point of view, where I see on a daily basis obese patients that are frustrated with the lack of possibility of losing their weight. It, and that's where now with a marvelous cosmetic surgery we can accomplish in modern times, we can change the, the, the body's contours and improve their well-being and the, improve their uh, self-esteem, but still, it is important to address the consequences of this obesity epidemic. So the first part of all this is, is the big question. Why and when did our diets start to change? Now, fo fossil evidence shows that apes and our early human ancestors uh, were fruit eaters living in environments with strongly seasonal climates. Around two and a half million years ago, the earliest species of Homo, that were our early ancestors, introduced more animal products into their diet. And this coincided with developing uh, bipedalism, meaning we walking on two legs. Uh, we developed the stool stone technology. Our brain started to increase in size. And this gave us the first uh, closest ancestor, the Homo erectus that already was a taller, bigger brain, and they started to develop also hunting skills and started to eat a diet rich in meat, started to control fire, starting to cook their food, and uh, they started to move from the woodlands to the savannas. The early fossils of Homo sapiens appeared about 300,000 years ago. And to give you a perspective, agriculture was developed about 10,000 years ago. So as we know by multiple evidence, uh, Homo sapiens was predominantly carnivore with occasional use of fruits and roots. Now our distant cousins, the apes, were clearly herbivores and they are still mostly fruit and root eaters. The agricultural age began approximately 10,000 years ago. And during this time, uh, this is about five 500 generations, the consumption of carbohydrates slowly started to increase. Now that really went much more fast in the industrial revolution that was about 250 years ago. The sugar consumption was about one fifth of what we're eating today. Now we're eating even greater increased amounts of carbohydrates in cereals, grains, dairy products, beverages, refined sugar, candy, and 
increased use of vegetable oils and dressings that did not exist in our diet for 99.9% .9 of human history. Now, have our genes adapted to this drastic change in our diet? As you can see in this graphic, we used to be mostly eating at home. In the 1900s, we ate maybe 5% of the time out of home. Slowly and gradually, we increased us eating in restaurants, and mostly we started eating fast food. By the late 1900s, we were already eating about 50% of the time in this way. And science tells us that even minimal genetic changes, meaning what the epigenetic situation is that influences genes, what the environment it does to change our genes, takes as long as 15,000 years to occur. Now, considering this history apart, I want to talk a little bit more about more recent times. Uh, big corporations started to grow more in power. And one big example of that, of that was in the early 1900s, Crisco came out. You all have used this product. It was invented by Procter & Gamble in the early 1900s. And the candle maker, William Procter, and soap maker, James Gamble, launched their company in 1837 uh, with their great soap, ivory soap and the candles, that was made from hydrogenated cottonseed oil. That was very successful. Why was Crisco created? Electricity came to us. We didn't need any more candles as much. So to remain relevant, Procter & Gamble decided they had to apply their technology to something that more people would consume. And that's how Crisco was created. So am I saying that we are eating candles? No, but their formula was similar. It, it was still this cottonseed oil that they modified. They did some chemi chemical changes and that's how Crisco came to us. Since the mid 19th century then, we started to use mostly seed oils that replaced lard, beef, tallow, butter as the main cooking ingredients. This has had major and devastating health implications. Now, this topic is so important and relevant that I want to, the, to, to present another video that will be upcoming uh, to discuss this uh, in more detail. Uh, in 1954, a young researcher from Russia named, named uh, David Krzyzewski published a paper that described the effects of feeding cholesterol to rabbits. Now, what he demonstrated was when he added cholesterol to their vegetarian rabbit chow, it caused the formation of ateromas. Now, is this really relevant to us? I have really not ever seen a rabbit eating a ribeye, but uh, he was such an extremely talented and charismatic guy, great musician, and he really thought that cholesterol was causing also all our human problems. If you want to see him, he used to discuss his findings and his biochemical theories in beautiful songs that he sang himself on the piano, and, and he had a lot of influence in his time. Blintzes and bagels, honey filled tangles from eggs, we use only the yolks. Eat them a lot and you know what you'll get, occlusions, infarctions and strokes. Simmons and chickens, good like the dickens, great if you're fattening folks. You fatten them up and you know what they'll get, occlusions, infarctions and strokes. They look and they taste so good, I won't deny you that. But the thing I'm about that does the job isn't looks or the taste, it's the fat. Kashyyyk dishes, all Jewish dishes, great if you're making up jokes. But you eat them a lot and you know what you'll get, occlusions, infarctions. Now, by 1950, coronary heart disease, or the heart attacks that you all have been concerned about, was the leading source of mortality in the United States. It's, it caused by then more than 30% of all the deaths that humanity was facing. Uh, the greatest increase in deaths was for, coming from myocardial infarctions or heart attacks. Why did this happen? Myocardial infarctions were pretty much non-existent in the 1900s, early 1900s. 
by 1930, almost 3,000 heart attack victims were reported. But by 1960, there were already over 500,000 people dying in the US alone with heart attacks. So the big question, what lifestyle changes caused this increase? If you see in that graph, the increase has been gradual and progressive, but in the last 20 years, we haven't seen a decline in the mortality or heart attacks. And that is really not because we have improved our lifestyle. That is more related to the technological advances that we've made. That's one of the things I did for many years as an interventional cardiologist, opening arteries in patients that were almost dead and being able to survive their heart attack. So technology has a big impact in mortality of heart disease, but the reality, the reason behind the problem has not been addressed. So what lifestyle changes caused this increase in cardiac mortality? One change was a decrease in infectious diseases, the increasing use of sanitary water, uh, more better housing. All that improved our chances of surviving into older ages. And of course, the older we get, the more chances we have of developing heart disease. But the other is the dietary change that we faced. Butter consumption was declining while the use of vegetable oils, especially hydrogenated oils to harden them to resemble butter uh, by a process called hydrogenation was increasing. By 1950, butter consumption had dropped from 18 pounds per year to just over 10 and margarine was on the rise from about two pounds per person to almost eight pounds per person. And at the turn of the century, uh, oil consumption had more than tripled. Besides our changes in the way we eat, what triggered this? There was a, an investigator called Ansel Keys, not a doctor, he was a physiologist, that at that stage had ignored already clear evidence from a very bright investigator, John Jotkins, that in 1957 already had showed that a direct correlation between increasing sugar intake, very significant by then, in many European and American countries showing an increase in coronary heart disease, or so clear relationship between the sugar intake and heart disease. He was ostracized and ridiculed because of the power Ansel Keys already had at that time. And in 1956, for example, the American Heart Association presented together with him the lipid heart hypothesis, trying to say a very simple and obvious thing in their minds that they had already proven that cholesterol caused heart disease, that fat increased cholesterol, and that way, fat was the, re the culprit for increasing heart disease. Dr. Olif uh, presented uh, at that time the prudent diet that was based on mostly corn oil, margarine, chicken, and corn cereal that replaced butter, lard, beef, and eggs. And this lipid heart hypothesis really took off. It became like a universal belief all doctors followed this. Everybody thought this was the answer to reducing heart attacks by changing our diet. And of course, the food industry used this to launch a tremendous campaign in advertising, touting the health benefits of their products, low in fat, made with vegetable oils, and very high in carbohydrates. A typical ad at that time read, for example, Wheaties may help you live longer. The Journal of the American Med Medical Association described, for example, the Wesson oil as a cholesterol depressant, implying that that oil would improve your chances of avoiding heart disease. Masola advertisement assured the public that science finds corn oil important to your health. Now, these people on the prudent diet that, that were placed on this uh, high cereal and uh, margarine and corn oil 
Yes, they had a lower cholesterol level, about 220, compared to the people that were continuing to eat high meats and fats. They were, in average, 250 milligrams of cholesterol. However, the study authors forgot to put in perspective the reality of their findings. In very fine print, at the bottom of their discussion, they forgot to mention that people on the prudent diet had higher mortality than those on the control group. So once the fat was demonized in the public's eye, the sugar promotion intensified. The food industry really started to work hard to convince people of their great new products. We even had uh, babies facing the, the advertisement about Coca-Cola drinks enhancing their chances of being successful in life and developing their brains better if they had a Coca-Cola. So how did this uh, diet heart hypothesis get so much significance? Let me just emphasize one thing. Uh, diet studies are really impossible to do in, re in a real scientific way using the double-blind co placebo-controlled studies. Most diet studies are correlation studies. Let me just present you a very brief example. Let's say summer comes in, you have access to a beautiful beach, and you go to the beach and it's very warm. You are tempted to buy ice cream because of the hot weather. The ice cream sales increase, but at the same time, you are tempted to go into the water and swim. And of course, you are more, more, at, more likely to be eaten by a shark. So is the relationship between increasing ice cream sales and shark attacks a cause and effect relationship? No, obviously the ice cream is not causing shark attacks, but there is a correlation between increasing ice cream sales and shark attacks. I don't know if you understand there is a correlation effect, but not a cause and effect in this example. Now, Ansel Keys was very charismatic and he got a very big boost with his poorly researched and fraudulent studies that demonize fats in our diet and consequently cholesterol. He published uh, his seven country studies where he stated that there was a relationship between the consumption of fat in some countries like Japan where there was very little fat consumption and very low heart disease and countries where the fat consumption was much higher like in the US where the heart mortality was higher. So this seven country study was promulgated everywhere. Everybody was talking about this. But the fraud behind this study was that Ansel Keys had really studied 22 countries, but he only used the seven that matched his linear graphic relationship at the best. Once you use the 22 countries, you see there is really no relationship between fat consumption in some countries and versus others in heart disease. All these made him become a real celebrity. He became a, the big shot at that time in science. And of course, as we all do in medicine, we were his followers right away. What were the consequences of the acceptance of fat triggering heart disease? The dietary guidelines by the USDA and the American Heart Association. And since then, the government has been telling us how to eat, emphasizing eating grains, sugars, fruit, vegetables, and putting at, as the least adequate meals for us, those based on meat and fats. But that is exactly the time when the obesity epidemic, that is the topic of this video, started to rise. You can see how it was a very clear exponential rate of growth growing obesity and overweight in our population for from less than 10% in the early 1900 to now close to 50% of uh, everybody being uh, obese or overweight. And in the 2020s, we are thinking that it's over 70% of the population that is getting to this level. And at the same time, this obesity epidemic occurred, it also started to cause the diabetes epidemic. You can see how the trend in these graphics is the same. Obesity epidemic rises, diabetes epidemic rises at the same level, at the same rate. Heart disease 
rises exponentially. Now you can see in this graphic that the heart disease exponentially grew to the 1980s, and then it started to decline very slowly. But this decline was not related to changes in our lifestyle. It was related that we developed new technology to take care of people that were dying of a heart attack. That was my main work at that time uh, as an interventional cardiologist and vascular surgeon to open arteries in patients who were close to dying and being able to help them. But the trends in heart disease have not decreased. The mortality has. As you can see then, all these different pathologies, chronic medical conditions, started to rise together in the early 1900s, and all of that related to the type of food we were eating. But now there's the new kid in the block that has been there for many years, but now we're really starting to understand more the reality of what visceral fat, meaning the fat that we develop in our intestines, in our liver, in our pancreas, inside our body, where I cannot do a liposuction and take care of it. I can do your liposuction in the fat that is from your muscles all the way to your skin and really shape you and get you a tremendous improvement. But the visceral fat, that's something that is really the main problem that we're facing. Now, the good news about visceral fat is that that fat is relatively easy to be lost with the right diet. But it's also the bad news that is the worst fat to have because that's the one that is related to the conditions I just described to you. The heart disease, the diabetes, the obesity, the chronic medical conditions, even Alzheimer's disease. So the most significant risk factors for this new entity that we're discussing more and more called insulin resistance is the presence of visceral fat. Now, insulin resistance is like the, an iceberg with all the diseases that are related to insulin resistance as high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, Alzheimer's disease, probably autoimmune diseases, worsening uh, joints uh, with chronic uh, pain in many patients. But the real issue with this insulin resistance is very poorly managed by our current medical advices we give to our patients. Now, this topic about insulin resistance is so significant. I'm so uh, interested in explaining it to you more thoroughly that this will be the topic of a new video I will present to you very soon. Now, all these arguments that relate fat consumption to heart disease, are there no counter arguments against the lipid heart hypothesis? No, there's many, many uh, studies that prove this is totally fake. This is not true. Even in the 1980s, in 1987, for example, the Journal of the American Medical Association published one of the Framingham studies reports. This is a, a, a town in, in, in Massachusetts where they have been studying the population for over 70 years now, and they have been is uh, studying uh, the lifestyles and different interventions in regards to the mortality and incidence of heart disease. But there were two very important findings published in the Journal of the American Medical Association that we have not really paid attention to. Even in, in this first study in 1987, they demonstrated that people over the age of 50, there is not increased overall mortality, either high or low serum cholesterol levels. And then in people with falling cholesterol levels over the first 14 years of the study, for each 1% milligram drop in cholesterol, there was an 11% increase in all-cause mortality over the next 18 years. So that's really very uh, interesting finding. Why don't we really hear much about it? Again, another big story. In 1992, the Archives of Internal Medicine, the director of the Framingham study, William Castelli, reported that in Framingham, Massachusetts, the more saturated fat one ate, the more cholesterol one ate, the more calories one ate, the lower the person's serum cholesterol. He even went on to say that the people who ate the most cholesterol, the most saturated fat, ate the most calories, weighed the least, and were the most physically active. That was published in Archives of Internal Medicine in 1992. Have we heard about it? Not much. Since 19, 1978, Mary Enick, a PhD researcher at the University of Maryland, 
started warning people about the danger of trans fat. What is a trans fat? These are fats that are chemically uh, modified by hydrogenation. And the purpose of modifying these fats is that to make them more stable, to last longer in our kitchens, to be harder so we can use it uh, like, like uh, lard, although it's not lard, or like butter, also it's not butter. And the government disregarded this very significant finding by Mary Enning showing us the tremendous health concerns with trans fats. And it was not until about 30 years later that finally the dietary guidelines in 2005 warned the public about the, the problem with trans fat. And it was not until 2006 in New York that became the first city in the nation to ban trans fats in restaurant food. So there are many well-performed studies that thoroughly disproved the lipid heart hypothesis. But science has lost against the powerful interest concentrated in the food and pharmaceutical industry supported by their paid politicians. As I tell my patients, we're in a bind here. We're behind the interest and powerful food industry making us more sick and more obese. The pharmaceutical industry pretending to cure us from all these chronic conditions that are coming from the way we eat and the way we live. And behind all that, the corrupt government that is being paid to just follow whatever these big corporations tell them to do. And this has sadly been adapted also by our medical institution and highly known as academic luminaries that are really part of this fraud. What has changed now that permits us to look at this in a more thorough way is the benefits of the internet and social communication that allow us to get more unfiltered information from people that would never be heard otherwise, that now can uh, present to the public their findings, their research, and even if they are not well funded by the pharmaceutical industry or are not well known in the, in the academic envir medical environment, now they can present the, their, their, their information and show to us how the reality of the relationship between fat and heart disease or obesity or diabetes is. And there is more or more ample evidence. You probably have already had access to this through internet videos, through publications that are now available to all of us. And these have really clarified and changed the way that many doctors are now understanding better. And despite busy careers and limitations of the way we can interact with patients because of time limitations uh, with very poor reimbursement by insurance companies, doctors are finally starting to wake up and try to help their patients in really confronting this epidemic and being successful. There's even cases of isolated honesty in the mainstream media where even the New York Times has published how the sugar industry has shifted blame to fat. Despite all this new information that is probably not thoroughly uh, divulged to all of us, there's still a tremendous misunderstanding and worry about consuming fats and cholesterol in our population. We're very, very concerned about eating fats. Every time I tell my patients that they should probably eat higher fat content and much lesser carbohydrates to improve their chances of staying slim after a beautiful liposuction and tummy tuck, they I always get that face of, what? Am I going to consume more cholesterol and more fat? What about my heart? So there's still a lot of confusion. And this is why I wanted to organize this simple and so small presentation to help my patients and friends to understand what the reality is. In brief, as a summary, what is the best way for us to eat and avoid the long-term consequences in our health? I think this slide summarizes my personal thoughts, the way I eat. I'm not saying this is the only way. There's ways to, even with vegetarian diets, accomplish something similar. But the reality that uh, this graphic of how I encourage my family and friends to eat gives you an idea. This is not a, a talk about advertisement about a specific diet, but 
I will get into that in a future video. But at least I hope this video helps you to understand better why we're getting bigger, we're getting sicker, and how we can start to fight this problem with very simple and very tasty options. In future videos, I will discuss more of these problems that we're facing, hopefully much more brief and more focused on specific topics. And I hope this will help you. If you like this video, just please click on the like icon that will help me to divulge this information. This is a very long video in regards to what I wanted to say, but the history of this problem is significant. So I think that's the first stage of understanding what we're facing. And then we can address each one of the uh, isolated topics in a much more brief and profound way. Thank you.